you very much for coming to my lectures. It's my great pleasure to come to Singapore every time. And um, I'm very pleased to talk about mathematics to all people here, most of very young. Um, so um, let me try to be logistic to see how it works. Let it works. So, um, So I um, only have 40 minutes to speak, and I'm pretty ambitious. I want to talk mathematics from all the way to the Euclid, to the mathematical is being done today. And the threat is the mathematics is very large, but I just try to use one thread that connects us to the antiquities, the prime numbers. And another theme that is appear maybe could be modern more than the mid 19th century mathematical expositions. So how um, it, it, it has always been and it remains very central part of number theory in mathematics. And um, I'm really trying to do some argument, although very elementary, because we are talking about mathematics. So um, because of that, by the end, I'm behind you very steep. That's the point I'm going to have to look very steep. We cannot do a lot of definitions. Okay, so first prime number, so those are prime, those are the, the basic. When you start with doing mathematics, you start with natural numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and uh, on this, natural numbers is the addition, very obvious, but then multiplication, a little bit more challenging. And then this is basically the relation, right? Two is a divided of six. And three divided by six, and so on. So prime numbers are exactly those that are uh, uh, not divisible by any numbers except one in itself. Like uh, three is a prime number, but four is not because four is two times two. So for some reason, one is not. So there's prime numbers. So the prime numbers are two, two, three, five, seven. And so it has been. Known from Euclid, probably uh, chapter right? book four or book five, to uh, prove this fact that if you start with any positive integers, so if you start with prime, then you put up the two numbers, and if one of them is prime, just stop there, and but if one of them is in a composite, and the factors again and again, and that is a stop. And so every integer is put up with prime numbers, and moreover, this is factor that is unique. And this is, and it's amazing that there is a kind of rigorous proof of that in the book of Euclid. That for example, 12 is 2 times 2 times 3. And that's a unique way to factorize 12 and put up the prime numbers. <laughs> okay. So far, so good. But then, from this very fact, it's very argument become very steep. It will prove this fact that they are actually infinite prime numbers. It's not obvious, right? Two, three, five. And why uh, why not at some point every number is a composite? I just put up a finitely many prime numbers. And you believe that it is not that, that is not possible. And he will introduce this concept of proof by absurd. Right? Uh, uh, so if you assume that they are finitely prime numbers. And write them down, P1, P2, P R. And assume that all other numbers are not prime. Then you have to run to contradiction. So let us form this number, N1, P1, P R, P R, plus 1. That is the number. And because this fact that every number C is called up a prime number, it, it just pick some prime number that is, that is divisor of A. There must be some because the factorization will fail it. And it cannot be need number, need none of these P1, P2, PR, right? Otherwise, the, the different P divide 1, which is not possible. You see? So that is a contradiction. So this number may not be a prime itself, but any prime dividing it cannot be in this list. I mean, this is not concrete. Have to add more numbers and so on and so on. So this fact, uh, I see the absolute amazing that 
that in three like, hundred years ago, people okay, come up with such a beautiful proof. Uh, not sure the concept of proof is well understood, but even the quite elaborate logics have been established very firmly as proof they are served. So let, let's now go a little bit further, right? Of course, there's uh, almost all prime numbers except two are odd, right? Otherwise, probably it would be a prime number or more. So all number three, five, seven, even 13, 17. So let's try to play some a little more elaborate games. So there are two, if there's, there are those that are uh, congruent to one mode four, right? It's like five, 13, right? So when you divide by four, the remainder will be one. And three, seven, uh, 13, uh, no, no, sorry, 13, yeah. Three, three, 11, uh, to three mode four. That means when you divide by four, you get um, a remainder of three. And the claim is that there are infinite many prime numbers on both sides. Infinite prime numbers that are congruent to one mode four, and infinite prime numbers congruent to three mode four. And in some sense, well, they are both infinite, but they are not equal infinite. There are just as many prime numbers that are congruent to one mode four as prime numbers congruent to three mode four in some appropriate analytic sense that I try to convey here. So let's try to prove this. This is very metric, I think, that um, can be explained in, in middle school or high school. Let's try to prove it up, probably absurd again. Actually, the, uh, the second statement is actually easier. So there are infinite prime numbers going to three or four. It's just the same as all big proof, just very slight variation of all big proof for infinite, infinite decimal prime numbers. So I assume that uh, there are only finitely many prime numbers that are going to three mode four. So let's list them, P1, P2, PR. And we want to construct a new one, they are not in this list. So we do the same trick. So but instead of doing just F4 and three here, right? To produce a new number, which is itself going to three mode four. So if it is a prime number, then we are done. This number is not in this list, right? <clears throat> I've had to rule out three somewhere then, maybe uh, some, say some little gap, but you know, it's not very really serious, very right? physically. So, but if this one is not a prime number, then again, it's a factorization problem to factorize it. And I claim that there's at least one of the prime had to be congruent to three mod four. Why right? so? If all of them are congruent to one mod four, the product had to be congruent to one mod four also. Right? So there is a one, one prior factor of n has to be equal to 3 mod 4. And that one cannot be in this list. Because it would have to be 3. Uh, in other words, to, to, to rule it out. And that would be a very contradiction. So that's good. So that for con 1 um, to 3 mod 4, uh, the exit, if it many prime numbers, con 1 to 3 mod 4, can be proven exactly the same way as infinite prime numbers. But you see that, that this argument break, 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 break down for con, con, con one mode four. Before it's very possible that if you end, if you try to do the same argument for P1, P2, PR plus one, then there may be, it may be possible that all the prime numbers occurs, factors of N, are not con to, to one mode four. Like program of, of P and Q, uh, both P and Q are convert to three mode four, and the product of one of them will be convert to one mode four, and that will not go to work. So here we need some kind of more deeper argument, and you see that that is how uh, here is some kind of really um, uh, a substantial progress in mathematics that happened here. You know, when the world is very elementary, you do this. So you assume that there are only finitely prime numbers that convert to one mode four. Then we produce a new number of this form. So we do four, one, but do the square. 
for P1 square, PR square plus one. And that was the, this one of the, in the rise of Fermat reason, Fermat is now like basically 18th centuries now. Actually it's not a negative, but on primes, dividing this number, H will be equal to one to one over four. So this argument is both more complicated and much more soft, way, more sharp. We produce this new number, and we know that on prime dividing it H will be equal to one to one over four. And therefore, it, and no, on another side, it's not, not going to be in any of these numbers, not in this list. So we produce a new prime number called one to one over four. And that's one to contradiction about if it, the, the finite, finiteness is not possible. So now we are trying to move forward, trying to understand this fact. So this fact is very beginning of the world of the simple city. Uh, it's very simple here, but it, uh, in going to lead it, it's just understand the simple city. On prime, dividing for m squared, any m, any integer number plus one, h will be equal to one to one over four. So that is basically what Fermat uh, observed. Okay, now let's come back to this notion of congruence is mode 4 P. Let's look at the time. Okay, we okay. <coughs> so far, so good. Any kind of questions? I'm going too fast. Okay, right? Yeah, I think it's using me middle school mathematics. <laughs> no, it's not true. Okay, so now, um, what? Um, so now we fix the prime number P. We are looking at the congruency, congruent classes modulo P, right? So it makes sense you can add congruent class, you can multiply congruent classes, right? And we can do it with any integers, can you move six actually? But for, when we do modulo prime number, there's only special that's going on. That if a number is not congruent to zero mode P, it's going to be invertible. Then you can find another number, so that when you multiply them together, you get congruent to one mode P. So that is what is special about prime numbers. You know, if a number that is not a multiple of P, then you can multiply, multiply it with <coughs> another number, to get convert one more P. So that's very basic fact about prime number. It's compact to the P also. <coughs> so we cannot do that with six, for example. You know, two is not a, is not a multiple of six, but there is no way that you can multiply it by an even numbers, multiple of two, can be convert to one more six, right? We only apply to prime number. And this really Fermat who, who observed this fantastic statement and though it's very simple, that any number that is not a multiple of p, if you raise it to the power of p minus one, and then you will get which one with one more p. Right? It's something amazing, some kind of very, very simple law, and <coughs> rather surprising when first time you see it, that you, you pick any prime numbers, and the 91, and uh, I'm not sure that they can find number though. Uh, 31, 31 is prime number. And take any number like 3, right? 3 is a, not a multiple of 31. And without doing multiplication, that I can even do 3 to the power of 13. I'm sure that that number is going to be converted to 1 more 31, to 1 more 31. So that is a uh, fair one. So why is this? So this simple fact about arithmetic hides actually some the very very beginning of the whole new area of mathematical algebra. I think for the Zemanov we're going to have a, a, a talk tomorrow about algebra, right? I think this is really the beginning of algebra. Well this fact is not about how you add and multiply uh, specific numbers but about the structures of multiplication, right? So there is this, this, they are exactly P minus one, 
Conwon uh, classes, mod, mod P, P mod 1, P minus 1, right? And they form a group. A group that you can, I mean, if you have two Conwon classes, you can multiply them. And if you have Conwon class, you have an inverse Conwon class. If you have another Conwon class, if you multiply them together, you get 1. So that kind of group structures. And this group had P minus 1 element. And just by enough to arithmetic algebra theorem that at a group with p minus one element, if you raise any element to the power p minus one, then you get one. So that is a fact of algebra. It's not you know this is some kind of very really abstract, it's move away from numbers, it becomes a real algebra. But this is the that I think this is very um, a beginning of something new modern mathematics, but it's very elementary. <coughs> So about this group, so this is a group of a p minus one element. Um, but actually, there is one fact that I um, much more specific about this. We even know what this group looks like, right? So it's very easy to know what the z mod two z look like. Or if, if I can't kind of know it as addition, right? Uh, z mod four z zero plus zero is zero, zero plus one is one. But you see that they have there are two groups for you, right? It can be z mod 4z, or z mod 2z plus z mod 2z. So the number of them in the group does not determine the group. But here we know what this group. So this is, um, here I, somehow I, I'm really in the, maybe the first um, undergraduate algebra course, the first theorem, in the, this group is cyclic groups. This is not the obvious thing. And this is, we know that it's a group of p minus one element, which implies Fermat theorem, but you know a little bit more. And this structure is very important by in some area like cryptography or something like this. That this group be actually a, a cyclic group of p minus one element. That means there is an element in that group. If you raise it to the power p minus one, we know it's going to be one. But if you raise it to the, any power less than p minus one, you're not going to get one. That one means cyclic. So from this cyclic group, um, we know, for example, this. If you ask a question, now if I, if I am given myself uh, a number a, not multiple of b, I'm looking to solve the equation x squared is equal to a mod b. So if it has a solution, I say that A is, equal to, is a square mod B. And if it is not, I say that A is not a square mod B. Right? For example, let us do P over to 3. Right? P over to 3, you have two congruent classes, so 1 and negative 1. So 1 times 1 is 1. Negative 1 times negative 1 is also 1. So 1 is a square and negative 1 is not a square. Right? So that is that type of question you can ask in general. And because of the fact that this is a cyclic group, there is a criteria to, to test it. You know, if it is a square, like A equals B square, then you raise this power, it becomes B to the P minus 1 equal to B1. If it is not, then uh, this is not going to be, it's going to be negative 1. So for instance, you know that, so, so, from this fact, you know, negative 1, you can ask the, the following question, is negative 1 is a square mod p? Right? So by what just come, come before, you know, that it is a square, if you raise it to the power p minus 1 divided by 2, then you get 1. And just do it. Well, if p equal to 1, to 1 mod 4, this is going to be even numbers, and then you get 1. If it is going to, to 3 mod 4, this is odd number, and negative one is in negative one, right? So this 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 minus one is a square. If already if p is equal to one mod four, so this very this fact, that's very simple fact. I mean, this is oh well, not simple. It is kind of only quite a good mathematic that f p is to the star is a cyclic group imply this this elementary fact, but is not easy to prove that Monza uh, minus one is a square mod p, 
if and only if P is equal to 1 to 1 to 1. So this is really the, what they say, the, the beginning of the reciprocity law. And this implies what you want. So I claim that if P equal, is a divisor of this number, 4M squared plus 1, right? The number that we, we form here, 4M, M squared plus M will pull up upon this. Then P H equal to 1 to 1 plus 4. Right? If you if P divide this, that means minus one is called one to a square. Right? And if it is called one to a square by this proof, we know that P has been called one to one more four. Okay? So right now it's already come very pretty other elaborate mathematics, although it can be explained in elementary way, but it's already some I think for the quite deep mathematics, it's called a simple law. Something about you see, this is very, um, when you think about it, it's, it's a rather remarkable fact. Here is a question modulo P. Either minus one is a square mod P or not. But it's equivalent to the fact that if P is equal to one to mod four, the fact, which is talking about modulo P, is related to another fact, modulo four, which is, Rather surprising, right? Why so? Because that is what the called the reciprocity law is. And it's, it really is some, I believe that it was the deepest in, in, the, in the science, in this science that I'm looking at the number theory, the reciprocity law. Okay, let's move on. So let's try to uh, put some notations and uh, more abstract things about this reciprocity or not. So let P is all prime, and A is number that is not a, uh, uh, a multiple of P. And I just write this notation, we call the Legendre symbol. The Legendre is also a mathematician, a French mathematician, living at the end of 18th century, during 19th century. And he just this question, right? He, he, this, is, this is symbol A over P with a big parenthesis. It's just one of negative one. It is one if A is square mod B and negative one otherwise, right? This is a, and I have explained this fact that we call this group, uh, FP star is cyclic. This is the same as minus one raised to the power P minus one over two, and modulo P. So this number is just deciding whether A is a square mod P or not. And now this is some kind of the crowning achievement of 19th century mathematics called the Gauss quadratic reciprocity law. Even this, this formula, this really beautiful formula, that P over Q times Q over P is something like this. So this is not very important, it's just some uh, is something given that can be computed about P over Q. But what is really extraordinary that this formula tell you that the, the fact that Q is a square root P is related to the fact that if P is a square root Q. Which is the very surprising when you think about it. Right? So by Chinese remainder theorem, I mean, you would say that something, some event, mod three and not even mod seven, would not be related, would be independent, right? So that is also basic thinking, um, analytic mathematical, if you have two prime numbers, then what happens at P and at the Q should not be related. But when this talk will be stated that it is it, just wrong. They are related. The fact that the further Q is a square root P and P is square root Q are related. Right? Assume that, for example, if one of those numbers is equal to one or four, then this is going to be one. Then if P Q is, is square root P, then P is Q square root P is square root Q. So um, in other words, <coughs> again this uh, this question um, So we fix Q, right? Like Q to be three. You can ask a question whether three is a square root p. 
random kind of stuff question, right? But then by this formula, it's very easy. It just look at either p is a, a square root three. It just either plus or minus one. It's much easier. Some other conditions. Okay, so now I, I'll come back to to the the um, to the question of the generalized this this uh, question about prime mod one mod four. Um, let's take any prime number p. Right? And some, some congruent class, A is, is not on the tip of the P. And we're looking at all prime numbers that are congruent to A mod, mod P. I generally take A, but I don't, I don't want to get into some too complicated notations. But the direct way is to say that there are infinite many prime numbers that occurs in any correct arithmetic progression. Of course, the first number had to be not to be p, otherwise just all multiple p just is not possible. But if you remove some type of this uh, restriction, then there will be if it many prime numbers. Right? That is true for n. If for every n, if the, the congruent class is prime to n, then there will be if it many prime numbers. Uh, so this is the theory that really happened in uh, like the end of the 19th century. Uh, and and we just, I just mentioned this. So this is much newer, called green tile survey that happened in the, I think the 2000 something. So green tile proof something that sounds similar, but it could be related. So in this theorem, directly theorem, they can prove that there's infinite prime numbers in any arithmetic progression of the string. You know, or in the, um, uh, relatively primeness conditions. And with that theorem, prove that you can make up a arithmetic progression, a finite one, as long as you wish, with only prime numbers. So here, there's just infinite progression, arithmetic progression, and that if it prime inside this, but you can, maybe the, there will be a gap between them. But here, you can just make up some progression with only prime numbers, but it's finite. Right? It cannot be infinite, of course. It's finite, but just as long as you want. Right? So this is completely different area of mathematics. It's not related to combinatorics, to an additive number theory. And this is related to the multiplicative number theories, like prime and reciprocity, and so on. And moreover, um, you know, for fixed P, again, all arithmetic progression mod p um, are, have infinite by prime numbers, and they have kind of the same infinite prime numbers, same infiniteness. So now I, uh, I start to do uh, more uh, very uh, advanced mathematics to do, do analysis. To prove it, the theorem, we need to do analysis. We can no longer uh, work with elementary number theory. So this starts with some function of complex variables. I think probably the one of the most famous functions in mathematics is this zeta s. Have you ever seen this zeta function? No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is a series, sum from n to 1 to infinity to n to the negative s. And s is the variable. Right? S can be a real number. But you know, more interestingly, they do it for complex numbers. And, this is a, uh, and if you have study series, you also they have study why this series converges, right? And you know that this converge, if f went to one, it's not going to be converged. This is the common series. One plus one over two, one over three, but that one will go to infinity. Right? But as long as f is greater than one, and this series converges. Okay, and, then, well, and here there's some um, Euler. I will go back a little bit in history, Euler in the 18th centuries. Mr. the observation that this is a, a sum can be turned to a product of a prime. Right? Just, just there, I mean, this is. Uh, 
this is very simple, but this is a amazing. So every, if you develop this theory, right? So one minus p to the minus n minus one, if you develop this, you get one plus p to the minus s plus p to two two s, etc. So this is going to be a product of a prime p of an infinite series, a geometric series. And to develop the whole thing, and you match, this could match these term by terms. So why it match? It's exactly the fact that every number n can be factorized uniquely as a product prime. So the formula beta s in this problem of prime, it's just an analytic expression of a very old infinite theorem that every numbers, every integer numbers can be factorized uniquely as a product prime. That that allow it to match term by term this series with a series we get if it expands completely this this easy product. So this is the um, order observations. And by the way, you see this gives you some, some another amazing proof, a new proof of the if it if it prime numbers. So assume you have only finite prime numbers. And so this is a product, right? The final number is a finite product. And there's no convergence problem. It's convergent one. And this side is not convergent one. This side this side is not convergent for S1 to 1. And this side is convergent for S1 to 1 if there is finite very prime numbers. So this all the product formula gives you another proof, analytic proof of the scientific prime numbers. So that's why this, this, this function data is really an analytic object that can be treated, can be manipulated by another kind of mathematics, but that deeply reflect on the structure of the prime numbers. So for example, so this is really only considered by, by Euler in uh, beginning of the 19th century, but really uh, take, take off with Riemann. And Riemann looked at this as a form of complex variables. And then from complex variables, he proved that although um, this theory doesn't make sense unless the real property of S is greater than 1, but you can, ex you can, you can do an, uh, ex um, continuation. You can continue to any S, any complex S. And you might call what about meromorphic continuation that is unique. And so, for instance, there's a very bizarre fact that zeta minus one makes sense. Although this theory does, doesn't, doesn't have any sense. So sum of one plus two plus three, etc., doesn't it's not convergent. But although the as a function of S it convert, it can be extended and it gives some very specific value. Of theta minus one is the negative one over twelve. So that gives rise to some very surprising Ramanujan formula. Ramanujan is much later. That one plus two plus three plus four, etc., is equal in some sense to negative one over twelve. That is very bizarre, right? Some of positive integers is a function, is a negative function. Of course, it doesn't. It's not like this. This sum doesn't make sense, but it, it makes sense only as an analytical situation. Okay. So, so we want in you know study this function and its continuation to prove the so-called prime number theorem. So the prime number theorem says the following things. It's not that they are infinite, but if you count, count them. How many prime numbers are less than a given magnitude in the n? Then that number is roughly n over log n. So the number of each of is quite big. It's not going to get than n, right? n is the total thing. But it's bigger than square root of n, for example. It's bigger than n to the two thirds. It's bigger than n to the three fourths. It's it just as close to n as possible, n over log n. So that is the um, the formula that was, uh, uh, you know, written by Riemann in this 
selling away the play process when uh, he introduced the Riemann Riemann delta functions. And he proved it under this what's so called the Riemann hypothesis. And probably the most celebrated for the mathematical and solved problems. That this function data have no uh, have no zeros other than those are over one over two. Of course, they have got three one zeros on even negative integers that I learned to talk about. But as we're on, uh, in some kind of critical line, symmetrical line. But just later, that um, some other people, like a French mathematician, the major one, uh, Adam and Belipusa, to prove the prior number theory with something that we can remind we have put in this. Um, just they have no zero next to the line H1 to 1. They cannot push it all the way to 1 and half, but it just enough, little bit over 1, that is enough to prove the prior number theory. And with this, then somehow you can do this in the, the, the best error terms in the world. Right? Actually, there's more application than this, but this, anyway, this reminds me is really that if you ask any number three or two, one, they really want to you know, be really happy that they prove it, will be my hypothesis. But anyone who, who, who says that I'm moving in my hypothesis will be treated like a fool, will be treated like you know, this is really, really crazy. Anyway. So now, um, if you just change a little bit, instead of one here, just put this Lejong to symbol, right? Plus or minus one, depending if minus one is equal to one or to B, or to a square root B or not. Then it gives a very similar series. And again, it can be continue, continue over all edges over on the complex plane. Uh, and actually, volumorphic, you make ten of over on S. So remember the from here, one point F equal to one. So this one has no poles. And this very fact implies the clay theorem on prime number that are interesting. It implies that there are infinite prime numbers in any arithmetic progression, and they are kind of equal numbers. And the, the ratio is, is, is like this formula, but it has some factors, like the, the oil the torsion number. <laughs> Anyway, so now uh, I'm going ahead to verify what I have three minutes left. I'm moving in the 20th century mathematics. So I say in this corner of the elliptic curve, so we're doing something much more complicated. We're trying to uh, look at this equation. Because the simplest equation method in algebraic geometry is called the um, cubic equation. You find an elliptic curve y squared with x3 mod a. And you are trying to look at how many solutions you, uh, how many equal classes x, y, mod p, satisfying this. And by the by the 1950s, Hassel should prove this this magnificent fact. But this the number should be of the form p minus a p. So this is the the main term. The number of solution must be something like p. But then the the error terms, that is a lot of inf interesting information. These error terms had to be at most 2 to the square root of p. So this term is p, and the next term is 2 to the square root of p, much smaller. But he have a proof that the actual sum of two conjugate complex numbers, each of them uh, have uh, absolute values square root of p. So that's why the sum of them cannot be larger than two square root of p. Okay. And then um, you can ask these questions. So with this, so this, if, you know, is something over a circle of square root of p, and look at the angles. So you have to ask how this angle varies when p varies, and there's a law for that. So for this uh, subtle bit measure, it's very kind of uh, surprising that you can calculate explicitly that it is two sin sinus square. Right? That's for some of the conjectures. And it took like 50 years to, to be solved. And now it is no really theory. OK, so let's try to, uh, try to um, well, uh, 
So the, the way to go about it to form this analog data formula called error function, again, you have to, to product a, uh, a Euler product, let me a product of a, of a prime B. But here, there are three terms. There's A, B, but then a quadratic term, B to the negative S, and again to the minus one, and make the one product B. Of course, this is some finite in many prime where you have to put some more complicated factors, but I just strip it over, over, over the rocks. And you can expand it and get some kind of series. But now it's coefficient a n, a bit more complicated. A p it is number a p, but the bigger n is more complicated anyway. And again, we really want to prove that this series, which are priori converged for real party s greater than two, can be made of continue and satisfy some kind of symmetric symmetries between relating the value of s and two minus s. And also has to find some kind of prima hypothesis that all the zeros had to be on the critical line, the symmetrical line. Here, here the, it, it, the, the flip is S for two minus S, and then the, the critical line is real for the S to one. Okay. And now we come to this some of this crowning achievement of number theory by the end of the 20th century, the wise, wise theorem of modularity theorem. So why prove that this this series that you made out of the integral but we want the problem you have to be a modular force. We just replace the n to the minus s by some exponential terms, some another term, like Fourier series. Then this is uh, this this whole, whole modular form that satisfies some extra symmetries. Like tau go to a plus b tau more C plus B tau. Okay, and and this has been this is proved by 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 Wise and um, by collaborators. And later something um, more involved uh, uh, and Taylor based on this work has put some conjectures by I think the, the last ten years. So my la last slide will be very fast. So we have the Lenz conjectures. This is kind of large the way I'm, I'm working it. So Lenz realized this, this kind of really yeah. amazing insight that the Gauss reciprocity law about P mod Q and Q mod P and Y theorem, which I'm sure that the conjectures is in the same basket. There's some kind of much larger and deeper conjectures from the Lenz reciprocity law. So it's very, very responsible uh, law and compresses both the quadratic theory of Gauss and this Shibuatanian law of Kadejo Valentico. And that, 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 that two work, not just analytical for just for any algebraic varieties. So any system algebraic equation, and the number of points you lose some way, it has to be related to an object called modular automorphic forms. And also we have another kind of that how these automorphic form are different groups, the lead groups, and we relate to each other. And that would imply a very generalized theoretic conjectures. So that is what I really want to say. Thank you.